not to make too light of the subject that Jesus is talking about, but I think we all can remember, you know, when you might have been afraid of getting cooties. Remember that? You get cooties? Well, the people were afraid of, what the Jews were afraid of, in a sense, is to get Gentile cooties, that the, they were contaminated and they would become impure. And so if they were around Gentiles, non-Jews, before they ate, and in a particular way, before they, uh, yeah, before they ate, they had to wash themselves ritually in order not to be made unholy. And so Jesus, he, he gets this vibe from them that they are judging him because he doesn't wash his hands properly. And, and he's disgusted by their understanding of the spiritual life. And he corrects them very, very boldly. And, and, and uh, you know, again, I think about just taking a step back and watching Jesus' interaction with these people. I mean, here they are. You would think they're, they are somebody in the society, the Pharisees and the scribes. And here's Jesus. He's trying to, he's trying to kind of make his mark as, hey, I'm the Messiah. And they come to him and they're saying, hey, you know, your people aren't washing their hands. And what is his response? What does he say? And again, I think this is important that he doesn't go tell somebody else. He tells them right to their face in that moment. What does he say? You bunch of hypocrites. And what are they going to do in response to our Lord's kind of clarity? Now, that we don't see it in today's gospel. They are going to go off and scheme. How are we going to kill this man? He doesn't wash his hands properly. And they're blind to this. Now, we, as I like to say, and I will say again this morning, we are not here this morning to judge the Pharisees on their blindness. We are here acknowledging the reality that we have the same nature, fallen human nature, as they do. And that we can find ourselves slipping into that same pit. The Pharisees were putting the less important things before the more important things. Can you imagine that situation in life? Putting the things of lesser value ahead of the things of greater value. Now, Jesus is very critical of their embrace of tradition. I want to talk uh, briefly, a little catechesis, a little Catholic teaching this morning as we get started. The, the Catholic Church recognizes three sources, if you will, of our doctrine. We have the scripture, we have the tradition, and we have the magisterium. Okay, so the scripture, we're all, we all know that, right? That's the Bible. That's the holy word of God. That is God breathed. The author of the sacred scripture is the Holy Spirit himself. We honor the Bible as the source of our doctrine. But at the same time, we do recognize, don't we all, don't we all recognize that the Bible did not fall out of the sky one day with gilded pages and a copyright? Don't we recognize that? That it was put together over a period of centuries, even millennia. That the Bible came to us through the tradition of Israel, through the early tradition of the church, through the apostolic witness. And then it was compiled and put together. And the Bible comes to us from the tradition of the church. And then, most often, not in every single case, but most often, our tradition is how we understand what the Bible says. And I'll give you a for instance on tradition, okay? What is a marriage? What's a marriage? A marriage is today what it has always been. It did not change 20 years ago. That is part of our tradition. This is how we understand the sacred scripture. 
to describe the human relationship that we call marriage. And so we have scripture and then we have tradition and then we have what we call the magisterium or the teaching authority of the church that will, will navigate us through the centuries of life changing and technology changing and circumstances and how do we apply the sacred scripture and the wisdom of tradition to today's reality. And I'll give you one instance on that. And this, this may be a bit sensitive for some people, but I also think it's appropriate to, to mention now as we talk about scripture and tradition and magisterium. You know, recently I read that the, uh, the, the Southern Baptists had come out with a statement. And the statement that they came out with was they, were, they said it was against the Bible essentially, uh, in vitro fertilization, test tube babies, and that kind of, those efforts at, uh, at um, at, for, at overcoming infertility. And their, their statement was that that's, that's not right, that's not good. What, what is the Catholic Church's stance on that? All the way back to the 1950s, the church said that the mechanical intervention into pregnancy is against the teaching of the church. And kind of highlighted the idea that when we start having the mechanical intervention into procreation, then human nature is gonna start seeking the most efficient ways and the most profitable ways, and children and embryos are gonna become a commodity. And that's an example of the magisterium. You see how we have the tradition, we have the scripture, and then we have the magisterial pronouncements. Yes? So now, what happened in today, get back to the sacred scriptures for today, to get back to the sacred scripture for today. You know, it's easier to wash your hands than it is to be pure, right? So they made washing hands more important than purity of heart because it was easier. Now that could never happen to you, right? Uh, that's not anything that we, that's not a, we could fall in. Of course we could. Absolutely we could. And so this is in the scriptures. This is recorded for us, not for us to recognize the, the futility of the, of the Pharisees. Now, where did this hand washing business come from? Well, in the temple, the priest would offer sacrifices and there would be bloody sacrifices. There would be blood. There would be the slaughtering of the animals. There would be putting the, the carcasses on the, on the, on the fire and all of those things. And it wasn't in the Bible per se, but it was kind of, this is the, the priests must wash their hands thoroughly before they eat the sacrifices. Makes sense, right? And then they were getting lax about that. So they kind of made it more, they, they emphasized it more and more. Okay, and then somebody had the bright idea, well, if the priests need to wash their hands before they eat the sacrifices, the people need to do that too. Now, this was not so much about, about purity from the Gentile cooties. This was just kind of being, they're gonna be touching things that were dedicated to God. So let's wash ourselves, right? And so there's a hygiene element there, and there's a sacredness element there. There's a, there is this kind of, there's something good about that. But then, well now every man is a priest in his own home in a sense. So everybody share, should be washing their hands at home. And then that washing your hands at home becomes anytime you've been around those people, you have to wash your hands because otherwise you're gonna be contaminated by them. And it grows and grows and grows to the point where they are washing their beds and their kettles and their this and their that, not for hygiene so much as to not be contaminated by the contaminated people. And so again, we see our Lord's irritation with this. And, and we have to recognize, again, this, this place, that here they are, 
They are judging Jesus because he doesn't wash his hands properly. He says, you bunch of hypocrites. And then he says, hear me and understand. Nothing that enters one from the outside can defile that person or make them unholy. But the things that make a person unholy are evil thoughts, unchastity, theft. Murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, envy, blasphemy, unchastity, murder. These are the very things that the scribes and the Pharisees are getting ready to go off and plot against Jesus. But what are they worried about? How much water he used washing his hands. Humbly, this is the second reading today, humbly Welcome the word that has been planted in you. This is the second reading. Humbly welcome the word that has been planted in you and is able to save your soul. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deluding yourselves. What does it mean to delude yourself? What does it mean to delude yourself? A delusion is a false belief. The Pharisees had deluded themselves about what made for holiness. Now I'm going to tell a quick story, a true story. I had the occasion of meeting somebody recently quite accidentally. And during the course of my conversation, clearly I'm a priest. I had my priestly clothes on. They had kind of quit going to church slowly, gradually kind of fall, fell away from the practice of their faith. And as they quit going to church, then they quit praying. So no church, no prayer. Why? Why? They were, they had suffered a tragedy in life. A serious tragedy, a real, a real honest to God tragedy. And as they suffered this tragedy in life, uh, they became mad at God. And their anger at God festered. And as it festered, they were less and less inclined to go to church. And as it festered further, they were less and less inclined to pray. And now they found themselves really completely alienated from their spiritual journey. And it just so happened that I found myself in their company and we're having this conversation and, and I said, you're mad at God. And she essentially said, I'm not allowed to say that. I, I, I asked her, are you mad at God? And she was like, essentially she said, I cannot admit that. But she did, I got it out of her. And she said, I'm not allowed to be mad at God. I said, you feel how you feel, you know? We can't always help our feelings. And I, 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 I challenged her to take off her mask. She was wearing a mask. As she, as she thought about praying, she went to pray, but there was a barrier between her and God, and that was the mask that she's okay. So I said, you, you, you and I, you and I, we have to take our masks off when we go before God. Sometimes we might have to take two masks off. We might even have to take three. There was this idea in the seminary, and, and I hope it's not too graphic for you. There's this idea that I learned in the seminary, but it's always been helpful to me. We have to stand naked before God. Nothing in the way. No lies, no delusions, no masks, nothing. We have to stand before the judgment seat of God knowing who we are and what we're about and what's inside of us. 
And you know what's easier than doing that? Washing your hands and judging other people. Yes or no? It's a lot easier to wash your hands and judge other people than it is to stand before God with all your masks taken off, completely honest, exposing your heart, exposing any evil thoughts that you might have or unchastity or adultery or greed, any of those evil, blasphemous, judgmental, negative, hateful thoughts and ideas that might be dwelling someplace in some part of our heart, right? We have to stand before God. And, and this is something else. This is something the Pharisees could not do. They slipped into a place where they put the less important before the more important. They put the easier before the difficult. They looked at Jesus and said, he doesn't measure up to our understanding of things. He's evil and bad. We must kill him. Let's wash our hands after we kill him. And I'm here to tell you again, we are not here to judge the scribes and the Pharisees. We're here to recognize that we have to. And, and I'm challenging you all. I'm challenging you that when you stop to pray, that you and I must understand that we have to take our mask off. And the process of prying that mask off our face might take a few minutes before we get really honest with God and ourselves. I remember, again, this is a little biographical information here. When I, when I first was learning how to pray, when I was first being taught how to pray, you know, it was, you have to take at least five minutes of silent time just to come to quiet in your heart, in your mind, before you can even start to talk to God or listen to him, just to silence yourself to remove your masks, to get in touch with who you are and what your problems are and what your challenges are, that you're mad at God or you don't understand or that you're disappointed. Again, I'm not saying that it's okay to be, that should be our disposition toward God. But again, it's not like we're kidding God. It's not like he doesn't know, right? And so we come before God and we know ourselves better than the scribes and the Pharisees knew themselves. And we understand that it is from our own heart that comes evil, not from being contaminated by somebody else. And so my brothers and sisters today, our tradition tells me I should wash my hands, right? Before I offer the sacrifice of the mass, right? I am gonna wash my hands today, okay? But, I am not gonna condemn anybody for not washing your hands before you came to church today. And so we need a proper understanding of sin and righteousness and holiness and tradition and all of those things. And I pray that we can fast and pray and give standing, if you will, honest and transparent before the throne of God.